Next, we have a representative from G. Hitachi. It's Christer Dahlgren uh, coming up to tell us about the BWXR 300 reactor. WRX. Did I say XR? I probably do that like 20% of the time. Right? Hello, my name is Christer Dahlgren, not Frederick Wittebeck. He's over there. I'm talking. <laughs> And uh, I'm from GE Hitachi. I'm also from Sweden originally, but I live in the US since uh, quite a few years back. And uh, <coughs> we've, we've uh, taken a very hard look at nuclear uh, and our own nuclear business. We used to be in the business, or are still in the business, of making very large power plants and designing very large power plants. But um, there's a reason, there's a very important reason to go smaller. And I think um, we want to try to accomplish deep decarbonization using nuclear. And that's kind of a contrarian <coughs> thought, at least in the US. Here it seems to be more accepted. Uh, the other thing we want to do is, uh, what we, how we accomplish that is that smaller is actually cheaper. And we're focused on cost and safety, of course. So I just wanted to let you know that we're not doing this in, by ourselves. We're not designing another nuclear plant that we can't, no one wants to build. <laughs> We're going to make this plant with partners, with investors from the beginning. Um, GE has gone through the design and licensing process in the US multiple times. We've ha we have two uh, design uh, acceptance, uh, design signs on the accepted shelf on the NRC right now. And we have two operating licenses in the US, but no plant built. <clears throat> I, I think you saw on New Scale slide what it costs to go through the DCD process in the US, it's several hundred million dollars. We've done it twice. So we're not doing that again <laughs> with this design. There's, uh, if there's no customer, we're not spending 500 million. That's just not doing, we're not doing that. So instead, we're going to follow the market, follow the customers, and uh, partner with customers throughout the development of this product. product. So we've partnered with Dominion, uh, who are an investor in, in this technology. That's a large US utility. And our Japanese partner, Hitachi GE. So that's the Hitachi part of GE Hitachi. They're investing in the technology also. And we also have partnerships with uh, Bechtel, MIT, and Exelon on the government project that we're going to launch uh, later this year. And we're actually going to get a little bit more money than what it says there, but, but that's being negotiated. <clears throat> okay, so how do you get to deep carbonization? What do you need to accomplish? <clears throat> um, the EPRI study, there was an EPRI study, a, that's the Electric Power Research Institute of the United States. So this was a US-based <coughs> study that came out last year. And that study shows that if you reach a cost between $3,000 and $2,000 <coughs> per kilowatt in the US, you will start displacing other, new, uh, other technologies. That, that actually kind of goes without, you don't have to be a researcher to figure that out. If you're cheap, you're displacing the other power that's not cheap, right? That's easy. But <clears throat> actually what was interesting about this was we spent about uh, three months on our own interviewing utilities in the United States, and not just utilities, but any energy consumer in the United States, including small cities, co-ops, um, small utilities. And we asked them, like, put technology aside, what would it take for you to invest in nuclear? And in, in the US, there's only one driver, cost. There's no carbon policy. There's no carbon tax. Uh, you can't credit subsidies. I mean, you can get them, but you should not base your business model. GE decided that because we've done that before and hasn't worked. And you should not base your uh, business model on carbon credits coming in the future in the US because the political landscape is so unstable, right? Changes very often. So you want to try to control your own destiny. <clears throat> That's what we decided to do. Uh, then later, uh, the MIT, MIT um, presented a study, and they kind of went through what are the cost drivers of nuclear plants? What is really the cost of a nuclear plant? And it's really the construction. And some companies do construction well, and some projects do construction not so well. And for instance, 
in Japan, the ABWR projects were done quite efficiently and fast. And so in the UAE, they've been done really well, uh, the construction there. So you can do it well or you can do it not well. And you need, to, you need to just look at the construction, simplify construction, and make it very simple. Use a proven supply chain, which that's, I think, where we bring some strength and other uh, vendors do too. And then optimize areas, all areas of the CapEx. So we're focusing very much, obviously, on a safe, uh, basic design, but a cost-effective basic design. <coughs> then uh, finally, the OECD NEA report that just came out talks about you have to have an, a, very, a mix of variable renewables and nuclear, and governments should basically support both uh, in order to be completely decarbonized. Um, and that nuclear power must evolve to meet future requirements, and uh, you just need uh, a mix. It's, it's the best solution. So that, those insights from the reports, but really from our own work, set some product requirements for this product. And uh, we came up with two things. It wasn't just cost per kilowatt, which is, I agree, it's a very low target. So this is our aspirational goal, is to meet this target. And we are uh, working our way towards it. But the, the re really important one is the, the total capital capital cost of one plant has to be less than a billion dollars in order for our customer base to go up. I mean, the number of customers <coughs> you can talk to at a billion versus 10 billion goes up exponentially. In addition, <coughs> at, at one billion uh, dollars, you get repeat projects instead of just one large project that takes 10 years. You can do three or four projects in 10 years. So your workforce gets much, be but much better at repetition, much better at nuclear engineers because they're repeating and they're doing, the, they're, they're learning from the last, from the mistakes from the last plant. And you can keep your workforce around. It's not so variable where you go very big and then when the, when the project is done, you let everybody go and you lose all your knowledge. So you keep this uh, knowledge transfer going in your company with smaller projects. So our idea is really that you can get cheaper and smaller. That's the case because this, basically the civil structures do not scale in our favor. Whereas when you go bigger from a vendor perspective, your metal gets cheaper per megawatt. But it turns out that it's a very small part of the total cost of the plant. It's maybe 20% less. All the cost is in the concrete. And concrete does not scale well when you make it giant. It's very hard to move, it's very hard to pour, it's very hard to make and it takes a lot of people. So if you want to look at the cost breakdown of a project, you want to look at your highest cost and try to break it. That's what we're trying to do. In, but at the same time, we leverage our nuclear components in the reactor vessel, um, which uh, there are no new components in this plant, basically. They're all the same as before. It's just a different size. Um, so combining the those two things, we can go pretty fast because we already have an approved license for a very similar plant. I don't, we don't need to develop a new analysis code, um, new fuel, new control rods. Uh, that, that's all been done. So the hard part for no normal vendors, I would say, is the fuel and the co codes. It takes a long time to analyze and uh, qualify. <coughs> also, the size, 300 is the 300 megawatt, came from our GE steam business, which is the cheapest turbine. <laughs> How small should we make the turbine to make it really cheap? And it was 300 megawatts. So we started like simplifying the turbine island cost and making the turbine island just a, a slab, basically. No basements, no floors, just one single floor. And with the turbine system that they've, so that's the turbine that they, we basically delivered to all our combined cycle gas plants. So we're using that one, and it's very, we've done it over 100 times, so it's not a first-of-a-kind plant or anything. And that type of system can be set up for a very easily flexible electricity, heat, and cooling configuration you know, to suit the needs of Finland or, um, for instance, in the U.S., there is no really heat, district heat need. But here, we could easily adapt that model to include a steam tap off that already exists, just makes it, make it bigger, put it in the heat exchanger, and send it on its way. <coughs> okay, so 
Uh, there is one key enabling, I guess it's an innovation <laughs> that we came up with that <coughs> enabled us to simplify out safety systems quite a bit. Uh, I should also say the smaller <coughs> scale really helped here too. Uh, because uh, these isolation condenser systems, uh, they were not scaled down in relation to the power of the plant. And when they get big in comparison to the plant, they can do many things for us that they were not able to do when they were small for the ESPWR. So uh, the vessel was scaled, but the isolation condenser system uh, was not. And now it can do all kinds of safety functions that we spent a lot of money on for the ESPWR. <laughs> okay, so even though we don't save money on this per megawatt, we save money because we don't have to build all the stuff and put it in concrete. So the new concrete solution, not first of all, it's a not a concrete containment. It's a metal containment in a concrete uh, holder, and the the volume is greater than ninety percent redu reduced. And since the concrete is the expensive thing in our past projects, uh, this was the solution. That, that was enabling um, innovation that made us believe that we can meet the cost target. Um, I just wanted to show you here. So the BD BWR X300 <coughs> is simply a small ESBWR with lots of safety functions and features removed, including the DPVs, Yanni. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but so we use uh, fine motion control rods from the ABWR that's in service. We use control blades from the normal BWR fleet. We use fuel that's been delivered 18,000 times to different plants in the world. We use a chimney that was installed in Dodivard. It's really just an empty cylinder. Steam separators and dryers from the BWR6, so they're installed dozens of times. And the RPV is made by a qualified RPV vendor like HTNE or ENSA or. It, there's like no magic here. It's all uh, a BWR. And I think in Finland you're fairly familiar with BWRs because Olke looked the one and two, and it really uh, builds on that legacy on the um, ABWR. They're, they're kind of ABWR ish. <laughs> Same design as ABWR. So by um, optimizing structures and making um, this LOCA feature and uh, making the safety systems. Uh, basically not being needed or being accomplished by already existing systems. We can make, the, a me, we can use a metal containment, we can use, uh, and it's small, simple, robust. We use it, we have an underground structure. We use a conventional turbine building with a very simple construction. And we have started from the very beginning with the fence in depth in the safety case, because it's actually really cost effective. If you start that way, it's really hard to adapt after the fact. But if you start with those principles, when you start the design work, the principal design work, it doesn't cost any more. And it's very easily translated back to the US once you've established it for the base plant. Because basically, the defense in depth will just drive you to make the right decisions in diversity, in, separa in separation requirements and redundancy requirements, and in design rules for each defense lines in terms of safety classification. And that can be country specific, in spe spe especially on the procurement side. I think that might be it. Thank you.